Hi everyone, I'm Karthik. Uh, I'm currently a faculty at University of Washington, Seattle, and I work worked at Amazon and Facebook as well. Uh, so today I want to talk about my past work, um, uh, which is on two deep learning architectures in uh, the context of recommender systems and natural language generation. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So uh, I want to think of it as two case studies. The first case study is on um, stocking the pantry or like this was an application where you want to purchase things uh, for like one week, two weeks or three weeks or maybe even a month uh, from let's say a company like Flipkart or Amazon. Um, so it's an online setting. And the offline context is you'll just go to a supermarket or you'll maybe use the Dunzo app and order a bunch of things that you want for yourself and um, and then stock your pantry, right? So this is how we would physically do it. But doing it online is not easy because it is very cumbersome to go through different web pages, uh, go through different, uh, you know, if you want to, you can do, let's say search, you can search for something. I want to search for maybe, um, let's say uh, biscuits, or I want to search for some cleaning products. But then let's say you have 20 items you want to purchase. You, you keep searching, you'll have to, see if you like the color or you like the brand or whatever, it can take a lot of time in an online context and it's much easier in a in-person store. Right? Uh, the other is you can just browse, just go through the list of products. Right? Just go through one, the second, the third page, fourth page. But in this case, for example, um, if you're discovering and browsing through snacks, there are actually 37 pages. So it is actually very cumbersome if you only have one product you want to buy, that's easy. But if you want to buy, a, stock your pantry, like you want to buy a lot of products, then this becomes infeasible. This is not a you know scalable solution, right? Um, that is one. The second issue is that uh, you know companies like Amazon or Flipkart have recommendation systems. So, for example, if you if you like this. Um, this is like an energy bar if you're going out somewhere or you're working out then energy bars are good so let's say you like this bar called lara bar uh, then it will recommend you other other things that are similar to this one so here it recommends other flavors of the same brand but uh, we want a diverse set of recommendations if you want to buy like for a month or for a week or for two weeks so recommendations in as, as shown on Amazon or Flipkart are not basket oriented, which means you don't get diversity. You get a lot of similar things and recommendations. So it's not easy to add diverse things to your cart. So that is the context here. So uh, when I worked on this, the business problem was to make it easier for a customer to fill the basket with a personalized uh, set of carousel or products of, you know, that are relevant and diverse. So, uh, in recommendations, we don't just recommend products. We also make sure it is personal to someone, like it's personalized. So you actually uh, find it useful. But at the same time, if, if we keep recommending you the same products, then you will say uh, that is not diverse. Can you show me something different? So here we were trading off relevance with diversity. right? And uh, the pain point as far as customers were concerned was that one pain point was that um, the number of units per purchased per order would be less because customers would take a lot of time to actually add products to their checkout cart right and then check out so instead of it taking five minutes it would take 20 minutes after 20 minutes you lose patience and you say i don't want to purchase right now i'll come back later which means your cart is abandoned so from the business standpoint, the goal here was to increase the number of units purchased per order and also decrease the number of cart abandonments so that the session is actually useful and successful. So that is the context. I just want to say, say that if you have any questions at any point, feel free to pause and ask. It, it really helps. Yeah. So we can clarify and we can move ahead. Hopefully the business problem makes sense. Uh, 
in terms of contributions uh, i worked on uh, you know coming up with a joint relevance and diversity model or personalized basket recommendations interesting to join model so you want to optimize for both relevance and diversity and uh, we demonstrated the effectiveness of this model in offline and online experiments so just a quick show of hands if you if you are familiar with recommendation systems so that i can decide if we want to spend more time here or not anyone has looked at recommendation systems okay see one hand is going up okay okay got it so uh, yeah so maybe i'll just do a overview of recommendation systems uh, recommendation systems is like broadly you can say there are two uh, two ways to do it one is called collaborative filtering and the second is content based filtering so in collaborative filtering the idea is that recommendations are based on behavior so you're not necessarily using any specific information about the product uh to make recommendations for example um if you are purchasing some product let's say you are a person who likes fitness you want to be fit and you will purchase products that will help you be fit maybe it is food maybe it is fitness products other other kinds of fitness products so now if 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 i know that someone else who is also into fitness buys something then maybe i can recommend that to you as well because you fall in the same category so that is the behavior based approach so for example if you see uh the first person may let's look at it mm, yeah so if you look at the third uh, row and the fifth row uh the first two products are liked by both the third person and the fifth person uh whereas the third product we don't know if the fifth person likes it or not however the fifth person seems to be similar to the third person so because the third person doesn't like the third product maybe we can say that that question mark is actually a negative so the fifth person doesn't like the third product so this is how collaborative filtering works obviously it is a little bit more sophisticated than just substituting the ratings um there are many many different methods in collaborative filtering but the idea is to use behavioral patterns to inform recommendations so that is collaborative filtering the other approach in recommendation systems is content based filtering so in content based filtering we actually use um ideas or descriptions of products to inform us on whether we can recommend a product for example let's say there is a new product that came on the market let's say on flipkart or amazon now how do you recommend a new product i have not seen this there is no ratings there is no reviews so how can you recommend it to a customer well what you can do is you can see what are the keywords of that product what is the basic brand or what is the basic idea of the product and see if you can get some embeddings or some representation and compare it to other products that are similar and so whoever likes those kind of products you can recommend this new product also to those customers so that is content based filtering um in practice we'll do both right because a lot of times you may not have enough description for example for products it's okay but what about movies uh, let's say if you're deal if you're looking at netflix then um how do you you know how do you, you it's it's hard to get content from that are representative for a video right let's say a one hour long video how do you represent a one hour long video as a vector or some representation that you can then compare so content based filtering um from a video might be hard on the actual content but on the meta data like let's say who are the actors what is the title uh you know what is the keyword for the story those you can still use for movies for content based filtering uh sai tarun i see you raised your hand uh, sir just a question 
Uh, so is this uh, recommendation system or the collaborative filtering or the content based filtering come under market basket analysis? Or is it completely a different uh, uh, what you say algorithm used there and here? Yeah, market basket analysis is a little bit more specific. I would say the collaborative filtering and content based filtering are more generic, you know. These are textbook approaches. Within that, you can have market basket uh, analysis and recommendations as well. Um, but this is specifically in the case where you're dealing with a very large scale system where you have maybe a lot of customers or a lot of users and a lot of products or a lot of movies. And you have a lot of missing ratings. So you don't know if a customer likes a product or not. In that case, collaborative filtering is very helpful. Um, so the so I, I mean basket analysis is something that is similar, but there are many methods. So you can say it's one of the methods. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Okay. So um, in practice, though, uh, people use a combination of collaborative filtering and content-based filtering uh, because, for example, if you have new new products, we call that cold start problem. So when you have a cold start problem, content-based filtering is very helpful to promote new products. So in practice, we use both. Um, sorry, did, did you raise your hand again, Sai Or was it from before? OK. Uh, no, sir. Got it. So. Um, so the so now we coming to the algorithm side uh, recommendation systems can be based on deep learning or they can be based on traditional machine learning approaches so a lot of this you can do without using deep learning so when do we use deep learning usually deep learning is used uh, when you have a lot of data and the problem is actually very complex it is not easy to solve using simple uh, machine learning methods and there is like complex decision boundaries or uh, there is a lot of complexity in understanding how you do recommendations or how you solve a problem, then we use deep learning. So a lot of companies do use deep learning. Now it has become bread and butter. Everywhere you see people are using deep learning, let's say YouTube, Netflix, Yahoo News, um, Amazon, Facebook. Everywhere uh, deep learning gets used. Obviously the problem does matter. Like you have to see if deep learning makes sense. But if it makes sense, then uh, it makes sense to use it, then we should use it. So yeah, so deep learning gets used in a lot of places. Uh, within Amazon, uh, when I was there, we are using it for Amazon videos, Amazon um, so pantry basket recommendations, and you know, different things. I think now there's probably, it's being used in many, many places. Uh, I was. I thought that at this point, uh, I'm not sure how many of us are familiar with the different kinds of neural networks, but I thought it might be useful to do a quick view of deep learning architectures. Uh, if people are interested. Yeah. So, I'm assuming that's an yes. So. Uh, quick tour of deep learning architectures just in terms of understanding and if you already know it then this is like straightforward if you don't or you're like getting to know then it's it's a good refresher of uh, where we use different kinds of architectures in deep learning so uh, the first basic architecture is perceptron as you can see at the top uh, left so perceptron is like a very simple uh, neural network, which mimics how our brain functions. You can say our brain has a bunch of, you know, billions of neurons. And perceptron is the most simple structure that connects neurons. And it can learn simple functions like or or and. You want to learn an or function or an and function, perceptron can do it. Um, but it has a problem with XOR, because XOR is nonlinear. So you cannot learn the XOR function using perceptron. But perceptron can be used for simple machine learning tasks like spam classification. So uh, where you don't have a lot of data, a lot of complexity in the uh, decision boundary. Uh, the next one is feed forward. 
feed forward is like usually the one that we see a lot. Uh, and this one also applies for recommendation systems. Um, so the feed forward neural network uh, can learn XOR as compared to perceptron. Why? Why can it learn XOR? Because XOR in, in a sense, if you look at the uh, figure on the top right, you can see what is XOR. XOR is when, let's say X1 is zero, X2 is one, or X2 is zero and X1 is one. In these cases, XOR gives you one. Otherwise, it gives you zero, right? So it is not a linear function. It's non-linear. So once you have a feedforward neural network with you know, at least one or two hidden layers, then we are able to um, learn a non-linear function. So feedforward neural networks can learn XOR. Right? Uh, other practical applications are like maybe risk assessment. We can use it for risk assessment. There's many applications for feedforward. Uh, Deep feed for neural network. This is something that uh, we got to use uh, at Amazon as well. It can be used for recommend recommender systems. Works really well. And then uh, there's also like auto encoders. So at the bottom left, you can see the auto encoder structure. So auto encoders are great uh, if you want to do data compression. You want to extract information. Let's say you have complex. You have images that are very like there's a lot of pixels and you want to compress it and have a good understanding of images, then autoencoders can help you because they'll map an image to itself. Right? But the hidden layer gives you the representation. So that's autoencoder. And then there's denoising autoencoders. If you want to take a noisy image and make it clear, then denoising autoencoders can help. And then we also have recurrent neural networks and uh, LSTMs and so essentially these are you take a feed forward neural network and you just kind of repeat it in sequence so that's why it's a it's called recurrent because it just keeps repeating uh, so this is something that is very useful for natural language processing uh, and natural language generation so something I'll talk about end of this end of today as well so um, essentially we'll be looking at two things two two different kinds of architectures today. One is uh, for the recommender system case study, the deep uh, feed forward neural network, and the uh, LSTM architecture, which is like you take the feed forward and kind of repeat it. Um, and this is something that we look for, look at for the natural language generation case study. So, uh, if you want to look at the different methods for deep learning for recommender systems, uh, there's autoencoders uh, that have been used. It's, you can think of it as nonlinear matrix factorization. You might have heard of matrix factorization, so autoencoders can do a nonlinear uh, version of that. And there's multi multi-layer perceptron uh, or you know deep feed for neural networks. And uh, this has been used in, let's say, YouTube recommendations, and uh, this is something that we also use at Amazon. And then there's deep semantic structured models. Um, very useful if you want to get extract uh, deep representations of objects and then use them for recommendations as well. And then sequence models can also be used in recommendations. Um, so this is when you have recommendations within session. So for example, if you uh, want to buy 10 products and you go to Flipkart or Amazon, you bought five products or you, you added five products to your cart. So now you have five products left. Suppose you already added, um, let's say some, uh, let's say you had already added cereals to your cart. So knowing this, the recommender should not show you cereals again because you already added it. So this is refreshing the recommendations within the session. For that sequence models can be useful. And there are other models like wide and deep learning. So, uh, in, in my past work, I use multi-layer perceptron for uh, recommendations. So here, uh, like, so I, I did a broad overview of uh, deep learning and recommendations so that we all have some context. Um, so I'll talk about the model that we are actually deployed um, uh, in, you know, for, for, the, for the business problem. So the model was a joint relevance and diversity model um, where uh, the relevance model is able to give relevant recommendations 
based on past purchases. Maybe you purchased cereals before, maybe you purchased some fitness bars before or Lara bars, and those will get recommended to you uh, because you've shown interest in them. So that is relevance. Diversity is saying, don't show me the same product again and again. Show me something different. So here it's a joint relevance and diversity model. So I'll talk about that. And this can lead to basket recommendations. So we can fill a full basket uh, and show it to the customer and then they can use it for purchases. Okay. So let's look at the relevance model. So uh, like I mentioned, the relevance model is a feed forward neural network. So the idea is that your input is a very long, high dimensional uh, vector, let's say with some 60,000 or you know, 100,000 uh, customer features. Maybe you look at previous products that were purchased uh, in, in pantry, you look at previous um, consumable products, you look at brands, item type keywords, departments, and so on. So you can get all sorts of information on a particular customer's behavioral pattern, right, in the past, and use that to make recommendations. So uh, as you might guess, this uh, input space, input vector, will have a lot of zeros, right? Because uh, a customer may only purchase a few products. But here you are actually encoding you, you have a, you know, it's a one hot encoding for all the, all the possible products and brands and uh, keywords. So for that reason, this is a high dimensional sparse vector, right? So it's going to have a lot of zeros, but the ones that the customer has purchased, we weighted by, uh, how, you know, how recent what the purchase was and how frequently it was purchased. So there's a logarithmic weighting that was done, um, to, you know, encourage, uh, recommendations that have, or use information that was purchased more, uh, or use information that was of products that were purchased more frequently or more recently. So we want to bias towards frequency or recency or both, right? So that's why we could, we weighted the one hot encoding there. And then there were some hidden layers. So feed forward neural networks have hidden layers with some activation functions. So we use value of activations here. And the output layer is you want to predict a probability, right? What is the probability that you will purchase a particular product? So that is something that we uh, want to output as a part of the feed for neural network, right? So for that, we use sigmoid activation. So you will get uh, output between zero and one for every single uh, neuron in the output layer. So that will give you a probability. So those probability uh, can be used as uh, relevant scores. So let's say now you want to sort the recommendations. You can sort it based on the probability or relevant score. So that will be the output of the neural network. So we experimented with um, you know, one, one hidden layer, two hidden layers, three hidden layers, and we found that two hidden layers was kind of optimal for the problem that we were considering. And we had lots of data. So there was tons of data that we used to train this neural network. Um, so interestingly, like if you think about a classical classification problem, you have positive and negative labels. Here, we don't have explicit negative labels. We know that you purchase this product, so you may like it. But we don't know if you didn't purchase something, you don't like it. We don't know that. So we only we are we are this is biased towards positive. So that is something to keep in mind. Is we don't know what. So it's it's a little bit different problem than classification for that reason. Okay. Any questions on this? Hopefully it's clear. So uh, this is the relevance piece. The next is a diversity piece where we want to recommend something that is diverse. So for diversity, we relied on embeddings. So you may ask why embeddings? Uh, well, the other option is to use category labels. Let's say you know that this product has this category label. 
uh, maybe this is cereals. If you just look at bottom right, it's cereals. Top left is cleaning products, right? And then top right is like uh, maybe food, but more like sauces and stuff. Bottom left is something else. So uh, middle is like uh, drinks, right? Some sports drinks and other drinks. So if you already have like the category type for a product and it is useful, then you can use it. But we found that category types for some of these products are very noisy. So if, if we rely on noisy data, then our output will not be good. So we decided to rely on, so again, you can think of category as like attributes or content, right? Metadata. So the metadata was noisy. So instead of relying on the metadata that is noisy, we decided to rely on behavioral data. So for behavioral data, we used, uh, this is a, something called product to x it's like you might have heard of word to x x to x you know, whatever. So here you can do product to x as well. The idea of product to x is that uh, products that are viewed in the same session, let's say you go to Flipkart or you go to Amazon and you're browsing, right? And looking at cereal and then you look at a drink, you look at something else in the same session, maybe they're all connected. Maybe they're all related to food, right? So you're kind of looking at similar things within the same window of time. So that is the idea. So similar products should have similar embeddings or representations. So that is the idea of product to vec is if you look at this matrix cell, each column is a vector representation for a product. And these vector representations are learned based on uh, behavioral data, specifically if products show up in the same session, then they'll have similar embeddings. So that's that's how we rely on this. So if you want to represent in two dimensions, you will get something like this. Things will all cluster and they will make sense. So uh, we use a diversity model, uh, we a diversity promoting model based on determinantal point process. So determinantal point process is a probability distribution over subsets of a ground set. So the idea is that it's now a subset selection problem because let's say you have thousand products and in those thousand products, you want to pick the top hundred that are relevant, but also diverse. So that's a subset selection problem. So how to promote diversity in this case, determinant can help with diversity, right? So that's the idea of, you know, determinant point process. And, um, so let's look at the determinant. And what are we computing the determinant on? The determinant is computed on the similarity matrix S. So S is based on this embeddings matrix, like here, this is the embeddings matrix. So from the embeddings matrix, we can get the similarity matrix. The determinant is computed on the similarity matrix by subsetting it on the subset that you care about, like we call that subset J. So S subscript J uh, for different sets J will give you different determinants. And higher the determinant, the more diverse the set J is. So that is how we can promote diversity. So here's an example. So let's say there are three uh, products, A, B, and C. And there are three vector representations for each of these products, right? Something that captures useful information for these three products, A, B, and C. So here you can see that the determinant is a volume uh, represented by these three vectors, A, B, and C. So higher the volume, the more diverse A, B, and C are, right? The lower the volume, the less diverse or more similar they are. So because we want to promote diversity, we want to maximize the determinant. So this is an interesting problem where, um, we want to, it becomes an optimization problem where we maximize the determinant. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have three products. There's one called Gevalia, there's one called Fiber One, other is Cheerios. So all of these two are cereals and this is coffee, right? So let's say we start with Fiber One. I add Fiber One to the check or to the cart. Now, these two are similar, right? So if your vector representations are good, then you will see that the volume here 
from adding this new item Cheerios is less than the volume of adding Gevalia to the cart. Okay. So we would prefer adding um, Gevalia instead of Cheerios. So that is how diversity uh, works with determine. So the optimization objective is to balance the relevance part and the diversity part. So for that, we have a trade off. Sorry, is there a question? Uh, if at any point you have a question, feel free to unmute and, or you want to share something, feel free to unmute and ask. So, so hopefully the setting is clear. We want, to map, we want to optimize relevance and diversity. So the first part of this objective is getting all the relevant scores and basically sorting. So you can think of the first objective as sorting. You're just sorting the relevant scores, right? But now the second part of the objective comes where you're not just sorting, but you want to make sure the sorted list is also diverse. So in a sense, this optimization objective is doing sorting with diversity, sort the relevant scores, but also have some diversity so that you can have a good mix of relevant and diverse items. You can see there's a log determinant. The determinant is the one that maximizes volume and diversity. And then you have a trade-off parameter because uh, it is not clear how much you want to do diversity or do you want it to be, you know, very diverse, you want to be little, you know, a little bit less diverse. So this lambda here will trade that off between relevance and diversity. So higher the lambda, more diverse recommendations you get. Lower the lambda, you get more similar recommendations. So that is how. Uh, and then how do you pick lambda? Well, usually through hyperparameter tuning on some offline data set, or you can also do A-B testing on Lambda. So uh, this optimization objective, as you might have guessed, is actually NP hard. So it's not easy to optimize it. However, if you take a greedy approach, we can find the optimal subset. Uh, and there's an approximation algorithm. But the greedy algorithm is, you know, uh, it, 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 it is fast, but also it has an approximation guarantee. So it will be approximately optimal, right? So that's approximation factors given. Okay. So the algorithm itself is very simple. Uh, we start with, let's say, the most relevant product. Let's say you are a fitness person. We'll start with the Lara bar or some fitness bar that you really like. That will be the first product we'll add to the set. Then the subsequent products will be added to balance the relevance and the diversity. So we'll greedily pick the next one. So you keep greedily picking thing and then you build your basket. And then once you build your basket, then that is the basket that we recommend. Okay. And there are efficient ways to do this. So that's what this is saying. Uh, I'll skip this. So let's do a walkthrough. Let's say these are 10 products. So there's vitamin water, there is cereals, and there is some paper towels, there's some Ziploc, some other products. So these are products that we you know, use a lot here. Um, so let's say that you like, you really like vitamin water. You like vitamins and you want vitamin water. So we'll start with vitamin water, right? So next one is also, the next highest score is also vitamin water but I want to have diversity, so I don't want to pick that. So maybe I'll pick the, I'll skip that and pick cereals, right? And I'll skip vitamin water and pick the next, I'll skip cereals also, and I'll pick, pick something to clean, because then I am getting diversity, and paper towels and so on. So this is how the algorithm works, is it makes sure things are relevant, but then it also expands the diversity component. So this is the algorithm where we are able to um, recommend, you know, relevant and diverse products to customers. So I'll also talk about how we A/B tested it. 
So it turns out that uh, at that time, uh, Pantry at Amazon was offering uh, free shipping for qualifying products in Pantry. But so, so then we thought that maybe in the qualifying products, you can actually uh, you know, do recommendations and make it easy for customers to pick those qualifying products because then they get free shipping. And also it's recommended, so they will, they will probably like what, what they recommended. Right? So that was the use case. So the control experience is that uh, you have free shipping products being displayed on the web page by different categories, like maybe some cleaning products, some snacks, and so on. In the treatment, so there's all A-B testing as control and treatment, right? So control we discussed. In treatment, uh, we added this recommendation carousel that is coming from the model at the very top. So, and it's, it, it, so as you can see here, it says qualifying items recommended for you. So that was the tagline we added so that customers know that, oh, this is recommended for me. And it also qualifies for free shipping. So the A-B testing outcome, so I, I don't, I, I'm not able to share exact figures here, but uh, these are the metrics we care about, like the number of units purchased uh, per session. And we saw an increase in that. It was a significant increase. Then this is a se session metric, which says, um, uh, what is the, um, you know, where was the session abandoned or did people actually, was the session successful? Right, we discussed cart abandonments can happen. So that also we saw a decrease in that, which is good. And then we had another metric on, it was business metric, and we saw an improvement in that as well. So overall, the A-B test was successful. So uh, in industry, you need an A-B test to make sure things are successful before you deploy a model. So here we did an A-B test and it was successful. So we actually made the change and so we said, okay, these recommendations make sense and let's deploy it to the web page. So I'll stop here to ask any questions on this before moving to the next case study. Any questions or thoughts? So uh, I just want to check Pallavi, how are we doing on time? Uh, I think we can take one 10, 15 minutes more, it's fine. 15 minutes, okay. So the next case study is on natural language generation systems. This is more recent work. So here, um, you know, we'll just look at one case study where you want to have a task oriented chatbot so it is a chatbot that is specifically for tasks. So you have a task and you want to respond to the task or you have a query and you want to respond to the query. So in natural language, as we know, sequence matters a lot. For example, if you want to do sentiment classification, uh, let's say you say the sentence is, I love this car. It has a positive sentiment, right? Then if you have another example, I'm not sure I love this car, that's a negative sentiment. So even though it is, I love this car, there is a not sure that came before that. So the not sure makes it a negative sentiment. So you have to keep the context, right? Here's another example. I don't think it's a bad car at all. So bad car seems like negative sentiment, but then you're saying, I don't think, so that means it's a positive sentiment. So the sequence, May, you know, is so important for um, the sequence structure is so important to make predictions for natural language tasks. So, and we also have to carry context. Sometimes, uh, so here, don't think was not so far away, but sometimes things are far away. Like you might say, I don't know, uh, let's, let's pick a name. Let's say Shubham. Uh, Shubham came to the department today and then he is going to be presenting today. And then who is he? He is Shubham, right? That 
that context came in a previous sentence. So we have to carry the context from some time back to understand what is happening. So uh, sequence to sequence models, as some of you might know, uh, is really helpful in um, capturing the sequence and also preserving context. So LSTM, for example, is a very good uh, model uh, that's been used a lot in natural language processing. Uh, one, you know, this is an example where you're translating a sentence to from one language to the other. So here we're translating from English to Hindi. So you'll have an encoder for English and then a decoder for Hindi. And this encoder decoder architecture is very helpful for task based uh, chatbots as well, because your encoder will be your input or a query. And then your decoder will be the output, which will be the response from the chatbot. Uh, and we can see, you know, chatbots are playing a big role. Let's say you go to Expedia um, and you want to, you know, cancel a flight. So nowadays in Expedia, if you're using Expedia, there is a chatbot and you say, I want to cancel a flight. Then it will understand that you want to cancel. Then it'll ask you some more information and then it will confirm that this is the item that you want to cancel and then it cancels it. So it is able to understand what you're trying to say, you know, what, what, what you're communicating and then respond accordingly and help you make the cancellation. Uh, of course, in Expedia, it's a little bit easier because they already give you suggestions on what to answer. So you, once you pick that suggestion, then it's easy for the chatbot. Uh, but here we'll be looking at application where the response can be free form, the query can be free form. So then the chatbot has to really understand what that is and then respond. So uh, one of the business use cases that I got to work on and I use was uh, when we have a device, let's say you have portal device uh, from Meta or Facebook, or you have Amazon Echo, right? Alexa, so you want to uh, ask, you know, you want to ask something or you want to do, do a particular task. Let's say you want to set a timer, right? Or uh, you're working in the kitchen and you want to play a song. Then you'll say, hey, Alexa, can you play a song? Or, hey, Portal, can you do this? So I'll use the example of timer because that's something I worked on. So here the query can be, uh, can you set a timer for five minutes? And the response from the chatbot is, sure. So this is not even a chatbot, it's a voice bot, right? So it's like giving out speech. Sure, I can set a timer for five minutes. Timer set for five minutes. So that's a response. So we have to make sure that the responses are, you know, the goal is to make sure the responses are human-like, natural, correct, and grammatical. So these are the four dimensions in which we, you know, measure the performance. Here's another example. Can you set another timer for 10 minutes? Sure, I can set it. And then so on, like this, there can be other examples. So the baseline model is like a template. Uh, template is something that doesn't use a machine learning model. It is just that whenever I see this query, I will give you this response. If you say set another timer, then somehow the template is triggered. There will be some rules. So you use the rules, and then you trigger the template, and then you give the response. Right. Um, so what are some pros and cons of templates? Well, because it's a template, it's correct by construction. It cannot be incorrect, because you decided it, right? you decided how, what the rules are. So hopefully it should work. And it will also be grammatical, again, because it's template. But because it's a template, it may not sound natural or human-like. So for instance, if you say, what is the weather in Jodhpur next week, right? Then a template response can be on Monday, it is, you know, 35 degrees, on Tuesday, it is 40 degrees, on Wednesday, it is 30 degrees, and so on. That's a template response. Every day you'll get a temperature, but maybe a more natural response will be uh, Monday to Wednesday, it'll be very hot and uh, Thursday, Friday, you can expect some rain. That will be a more natural human response, but that is hard for a template, right? So here we want to see how to make responses more natural. So that's one of the downside of a template. And also with template, with every new domain you add, you have to create new templates. For example, 
If you want to set a timer, that's a timer domain. If you want to set an alarm, that's an alarm domain. Reminder, reminder domain. Like this, you can keep creating many, many, many domains, right? So for every domain, you have to create templates and that is not scalable. So scalability is another issue with um, template. But templates are used a lot in industry for a lot of chatbots like Expedia, we spoke about this template responses. You just have to pick one of the template responses. So they do get used a lot. So, but if you want more naturalness, we want the chatbot to be more natural, like more human-like, then you have to use machine learning because machine learning can be used to generate sentences that look more natural. Uh, I'll skip some of these things. Like you can do free text modeling and free text modeling has some issues too. In free text modeling, there is no structure to the input output. Um, you pass this in, to a deep learning model and you get this output. The problem is that the deep learning model can mess things up. For example, hallucination. Instead of just saying timer set, it can say timer set set for 10 minutes. So that would be like repeated words can happen uh, when free text. Grammaticality can be an issue. So timer set 10 minutes, it's not grammatical. Uh, correctness can be an issue. You say set a timer for 10 minutes, it'll say, okay, timer set for five minutes. So these are some issues with the free text modeling. So you have to guide the model, you have to give some structure, then these issues can be taken care of. That's why we do structure text modeling and uh, we use by LSTM with structure, um, where you have an input scenario with, which has a query and structured information. So instead of just query, like in free text modeling, you have query plus structured information. So for example, uh, query is, can you set a time of five minutes and response is sure, Time set for five minutes. And the scenario will be the structured structured input is can you set a timer for five minutes? And there's a separator, and then there is some more structure here. Uh, these are some arguments that can be used to guide the model. So and the output will also be a structured response. So you can see it is still saying sure timer set for five minutes, but that sentence is encapsulated inside this structure. So that structure makes it easy for the machine learning model to learn and not make mistakes. Um, and we call this, um, you know, if you want to check if the structure is the same between input and output, we came up with a metric called tree accuracy that can, because if you look at this, these tags here, they have a tree structure, they have a nested structure. So it's like a tree. So, we look at the tree accuracy as one automated metric for the chatbot. And then there's other human metrics like correctness, grammaticality, naturalness. And uh, we published this in uh, Coling 2020. And uh, it also got a best paper award in the industry track. Uh, we call it best paper practices for data efficient modeling and natural language generation. How to train production ready neural models with less data. So there's much more in this. Uh, if you Google this, you'll find a paper. Uh, there's a lot more details in this paper. It's a, uh, feel free to uh, take a look at it. But I just want to mention one interesting thing in this work was that when we work in, in the industry, we work on data sets and we work in stages because you go from like prototyping stage to like more expansive testing stage to A-B testing stage. So here's like, you know, the train validation test, the first three components are bread and butter. We do it in industry, you do it in academia, no matter where you are. Train validation test is bread and butter in machine learning, right? But here we also had a held out test, which is, uh, which could have a different distribution than the test data here, used for prototyping. And the reason is the held out test um, doesn't have labels, but it has, uh, it has all possible combinations in the queries. So some of those combinations may not be captured in the training data. So we just want to make sure that we don't have representation issues. Like you do well on training, but you do badly on test. That is not acceptable. So you're overfitting or you have less data. And then there's like internal testing and then A-B testing. So these are some phases. So interestingly, we saw with our models, like the bi LSTM model that we use that I mentioned, um, that for training, validation, and test, we had 99% tree accuracy. 
but for held out test set we had less than 90% sometimes really even even less like 60% and we didn't understand why it's happening why is it that there is this issue and then we found it's a representation issue so there are some um, scenarios in the held out test set that are not captured in training so that means it's a representation issue so we we fixed it through mistake analysis you can do mistake analysis to determine what mistakes are happening in your model and why right uh, where is it happening and so when you understand where it's happening you can fix those issues so i'll give you one example uh, here's a query can you set a timer for 1 hour and 30 minutes right the response is sure timer set for 1 hour so why is it ignoring the sorry this is supposed to be 30 minutes not 5 minutes so why is it ignoring 30 minutes? Because maybe in training data, it has not seen this combination of hour and minutes. Maybe it has only seen hours, minutes, and seconds. So it's a problem of representation. There is not enough representation of these scenarios in the training, right? And that's why we're getting these kind of responses. So we notice these issues in the held out test set. And so uh, what we did is generating data is expensive, so we did data augmentation. We generated, like, uh, I mean, um, we automatically generated data. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, otherwise, we had data being generated by uh, through through annotation, manual annotation. Here, we just automatically generated the data. Right? So that uh, that that helped fix the data representation issue. So here. After doing that, our accuracy went from 90% to 99%. So we were back to full accuracy once we did the data augmentation. Um, okay. There's a few other things I want to mention, but maybe, yeah, I'll just mention this thing. So if you want to look at how a pipeline typically looks in an industry, it kind of looks like this, but maybe it can be even more elaborate. There's like the data collection phase. A lot of times in Academia, the data is already available. You already have the data, so you don't have to worry about it, right? You just download the data or it's already there. There's a standard data set. In industry, you have to work on data collection. Uh, and you may have to work in with multiple teams to make sure the data is collected. So we did a lot of that. Uh, yeah. And uh, there can be noise issues, there can be delays and all of that stuff. And then there is like, you know, you have to clean the data and, you know, make sure it's in the proper format. And then you do the model training. So this can happen multiple times um, because you're prototyping. Then there is evaluation. So evaluation also, we have like very, very elaborate evaluation. Uh, there is automated evaluation, there's human evaluation. Um, there is, uh, you know, you also do live testing. Uh, there's many, many different kinds of things. So, which makes sure that once you launch, um, let's say we launch a domain, you do not have, you have least amount of issues. Because after you launch, if customers complain that something is not working, then that doesn't, uh, you know, that's not the best place to be. So before you get there, we do a lot of extensive testing. So that's very, very important. Um, more details on the data modeling and, and there's also productionization in productionization there's a lot of work that gets done as well uh, but i think i'll skip that for now um so yeah for this uh task oriented chatbots we saw after doing all these fixes we had 100 percent accuracy on the automated tree tree accuracy metric and for human evaluation also, we got like correctness and grammaticality. We had very good accuracy. So it was matching the templates. But where we actually improved on the model was the naturalness. So making the responses sound more natural. That is where we, the models have uh, improvement. OK, so I'll just summarize, uh, because it, we already spent a lot of time. Uh, Deep learning models are very ubiquitously used across academia and industry for solving machine learning problems. 
um, obviously you have to ask yourself does this problem need deep learning or you know you can use simpler models like logistic regression or uh, something simple right a lot of times heuristics can also work um, baseline models do a good job but if there is a need then deep learning can can really help and then we looked at two case studies recommender systems and natural language generation system and we saw how different kinds of deep learning architectures do use get used there like for recommender system we use feed forward neural network for natural language generation sequence models are more useful so yeah i think that's about it if you have any questions or thoughts you can discuss that Hi, Karthik. Uh, thanks for this nice talk. Uh, I have one question. Uh, so, means what are the uh, challenges you see in this space, like future challenges? So, for example, what uh, performance you are getting for this particular problem looks like uh, like ideal solution. So, what what are the future challenges for the natural language generation problem? Yes. Yes. I, so there are many many challenges in uh, in natural language generation system. Like one is uh, you know model maintenance. Mm -hmm. Like like once you generate a model, then we want to automatically update the model when you get new data. So uh, that can have issues. So there is a that that goes into model infrastructure. So model infra or uh, model ops uh, DevOps. So ML ops, sorry, machine learning operations. So that that has a lot of uh, challenges, <laughs> as as many of us know here. So mm -hmm. maintaining a full pipeline end to end from data collection all the way to evaluation and and deployment. So automatic deployment of these models is has been a challenge. Although um, when we work closely with ML infra engineers, it makes it, it becomes easier to at least scale to some extent but uh you know scalability is always a challenge <laughs> yeah either on the yeah. side or yeah and uh, generalizing to the new domain might still be very challenging right uh, generalizing to new domain is also challenging uh so we want so that's the thing so we want to uh, we, we thought of developing models that are kind of domain agnostic so that they are not uh, too impacted by a new domain. So mm -hmm. we we tried doing cross training, so across different models to improve the domain agnosticness of models, and that also helps. So you can you we can use uh, like multitask learning kind of a idea across different uh, domains, so that we can generalize better. Um, the other thing in the industry context is that simple is always better so mm -hmm. after all of this work we decided to also try out uh, generating a lot of possible templates that are grammatically correct and natural but then letting the algorithm pick which one is best best template for so kind of not giving too much freedom makes it also easy to scale if you give too much freedom to the model, then it makes mistakes, and then we have issues in scaling. So that is a trade-off. And uh, what is your comment on all these uh, pre-training-based models for like like GPTs and all? Yeah, yeah, pre-training pre is really helpful for sure. Uh, so for 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 uh, the for for the task that we are looking at, we had some specific things going on. So we did experiment with pre-training, but since we have specific task-oriented uh, language, we would have to fine-tune on, you know, and we were also not having a lot of data. Uh, so we were, we had a data shortage issue. So uh, that's why we went with a simpler model. Uh, so, but otherwise, yeah, pre-training is, uh, if we have enough data, pre-training is amazing. Pre-training-based models are great for fine-tuning. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks, Karthik. Thanks for the nice talk. Also. Yeah, it, there might be more questions. 
Uh, we can take some more questions really quickly. Any other questions from the participants? Hi, Kartik. Yeah. Hi, Kartik. This is Shubham. Yeah, yeah sure. thank you for the wonderful presentation. Actually, I have some few questions. Uh, so, uh, which type of extractor uh, do you have used for the tree type structure? And uh, and my second question is, what are the things you have considered uh, while doing the data augmentations? What are the considerations like uh, you have considered only the combinations of one hour and 30 minutes and augmented the data? And what are the other things you have considered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. So what we did is we did bucket analysis. So that means we didn't. Uh, so we have scripts. So you can write scripts to uh, go through the you know training data and figure out the patterns. So we just figure out what patterns or combinations of these uh, structures show up, and then uh, bucket them at a high level. You know, coarse grained, fine grained. So you can do different kinds of bucketing. You can go one layer deep, two layer deep, three layer deep in the tree structure, and then see uh, what is the histogram of the uh, of these buckets, right? And if that histogram has a mismatch between your held out test set and your training data set, that means you do not have good representation for those in the training, right? So we automatically figured out which um, combinations have issues, right? And then we went in and did augmentation for those. And so that I think that is one of your questions. The other question, yes. right? Does that answer one of your questions? Yes, yes. It is. The other question was, how do you generate the tree structure? Yeah, which ex extractor you were using for that? So that is part of the natural language pipeline. So, you know, like uh, th there's different modules, right? Like a query comes in and then it goes through natural language understanding. Then it goes through like um, dialogue systems. The dialogue systems gives us the input for the generation. So a lot of uh, background work has already happened, like intent classification, uh, named entity recognition, so all of those uh, modules give us the structure, structure you know, help, help us understand what the structure are. Then there are different uh, libraries that go through this and add those tags, right? And then those tags get compiled and then finally you get the tree structure. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank, thank you, thank you. But it's not a lot of tags. We don't have like too many of those uh, tags, but it does change with domains. So every domain will have some specific tags, and there are some generic tags also in that, like the one I shared. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that is um, that is something like it's not it's not complicated, but it is something that comes from a previous module. Okay. Any other question? So I guess there are no more questions. So thank you, Kartik, for the wonderful talk. And thank you for joining us. It was very nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for thank you everyone. OK, bye-bye. Bye-bye.